Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation with Stacy Miller, curator of the Global Language of Headwear, Cultural Identity, Rites of Passage, and Spirituality. My name is Kathy Godin. I'm the STEM Education Coordinator here at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping rules to cover. First of all, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we will be uploading it to our social media platforms, including our website. Please keep yourselves muted during the entire presentation. If you do have a question during the program, please use the chat box to type your question in. And if time allows at the end of the presentation, we will try to answer those questions. I'm very excited to have Stacy joining us today. Her exhibit is on display at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum through October 24th. We invite you to come in person to see it. Okay. It's my great pleasure to introduce Stacy Miller, the curator of our special exhibit. She is a uh, she calls herself a mitrologist, which she can <laughs> hopefully explain that to us, but um, she is a collector and an authority on cultural significance of hats and headdresses. Knowing something about a hat and understanding its function can deepen our knowledge of other cultures and instill an awareness and appreciation of the values and attitudes we as humans share. With a passion for travel and a fascination with other lifestyles, Stacy has researched the cultural significance of hats and headwear, and um, she is understanding the stories that those hats tell, and she is going to be joining us today to share some of those stories. So with all that being said, welcome, Stacy. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Sometimes I forget to turn the mute off. Um, but anyway, I, I appreciate you um, inviting me to have this opportunity to share the collection with, with people who are interested in listening in and, uh, and be part of the, the exhibition in, in a remote way. So I'm excited to be here too. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to begin our conversation with you telling us a little bit about how and why you began collecting hats. Well, when people ask me that, I sort of smile and go, yep, 1300 hats later, it was a mistake. <laughs> I really did. I, I mean, I really never intended to develop or have any kind of collection at all. Um, so that's what I mean by a mistake. It was, it was not at all intentional. But um, years ago, probably oh, back in 1980, I had, a, had graduated from college and had an opportunity to live with a family that my family knew in uh, in southern Spain. And since I've always loved to travel and learn other languages, I thought that this was a great opportunity. So I um, saved some money, went over there with the intention of teaching myself Spanish. And after I'd been there really a short time, I hardly knew any Spanish at all at that point. I, I bet I'd been there maybe a month. Um, I, I was teaching myself. So every day I get out a magazine and, and translate and you know, some of the articles. And one day I translated an article that was basically an advertisement for somebody who was looking for people to accompany uh, a guy in Madrid, wanted people to accompany him on a trip from Spain to India in a big old reformatted school bus. And I said, wow, that sounds like a big adventure. So I ended up signing up. Um, and oh, I bet a week later, I took off with a group of 22 Spaniards and we drove all the way from Spain to India. And it was a four month voyage. It was an amazing, I can't believe decades later, I'm still talking about it, but it was really an amazing adventure. And that's where I started collecting hats or, or buying hats at least. And shortly, maybe a week into our trip, we had crossed through most of Europe and arrived one day in Istanbul, which is the cultural capital of Turkey, um, not the political capital. And we were parked, I'm sure you could never do this today, but we were parked in, in sort of a very central area, um, just a block or two from um, a very famous mosque called Sultan Ahmet, 
mosque. And it's a tourist attraction, but it's also a place of worship. And we were sort of, we were just parked in this bus, um, really in, in the center of the city. And I woke up in the morning, looked outside the window, and was really astonished to see all these men walking by with these colorful skull caps on their heads. And this was back in an era where Americans, for the most part, had stopped wearing hats. So this I found very, very intriguing. And as we went out later in the day exploring the city, uh, we visited the mosque. And outside of the mosque, there was a man selling skull caps. And for probably 25 cents, I bought the simple one. It's just a very simple white cotton hat um, with a little bit of red embroidery. But he was there selling hats because, or skull caps because it is a requirement in the Muslim religion that when a man enters a place of worship, he has to have his head covered. Um, it's a way of showing, you know, sort of devoutness and a respect for God. And it's a it's a um, custom that is also true in the in the Jewish religion, where men uh, will cover their heads when they walk into a temple um, with a yarmulke. So that was that, the first hat, and it was really, for me, a souvenir, and uh, it turned out to be very evocative of the country that I was traveling in, and in fact, that whole region where we saw lots of skull caps. Um, but it was, in many ways, a perfect souvenir, which is how the collection started. It was cost probably, you know, I don't know, I'm sort of making it up at 25 cents. It was soft. It, I could sort of ball it up and jam it in the uh, little corner of my backpack. But it was, um, you know, very reminiscent of the culture and the people that I met there. So that was that was the beginning of the collection. <laughs> Great. And so our next slide includes several hats that most people are familiar with. And just a quick question, how mm -hmm. do the hats that we use in our everyday lives relate or connect to your exhibit? Well, these hats, the ones you see on the screen, I think open a window into our culture. And I, I think there's a tendency when people look at the hats, many of the hats that I have in my um, collection or that are in the exhibition, the reaction of most people is to say, wow, those things are really weird. I can't believe people wear them on their heads. But we sort of lose sight of our own, um, you know, what we dress, we take, we take, you know, our lives in many ways for granted. And we forget that even though we don't have a big hat wearing culture that we do have hats and the hats do, as they do in other cultures, reveal something about who we are. Um, and, and basically what our society is about and where we fit into it. So just as a ex couple example, I have two baseball caps, very, very American style hats, but they, the two, the one from Detroit and the, the John Deere hat, both tell something about the person wearing it. Um, baseball caps now you see everywhere around the world. So you don't necessarily um, pinpoint somebody as being American. But if you recognize the, the logo on the blue Detroit hat, you would recognize you know, that that person's from that part of the country, from Detroit, uh, perhaps supports a particular uh, sports team. The John Deere hat you know, might indicate that the person's a farmer or does some work outside, although, of course, that's, that's a little bit of a stereotype. But it does say something, again, about who that person is and perhaps what kind of work he does. Um, the cowboy hat, I wanted to include because it's it's really an uh, an American icon. It's a hat that you can take almost anywhere in the world, and people will recognize it as being sort of the you know an all American hat. Uh, outside of the United States, people are really fascinated by our um, history of cowboys and Indians, and they're all you know people know John Wayne and all the Western movies. So it's a hat that. One tells a story and gives some insights into the history of our culture and sort of speaks to um, a particular era in American history when, you know, with the westward expansion and people, you know, moving out west, um, sort of riding horses and um, it taming, taming in a sense that part of the country. But also it says something about, I think, the way Americans like to see themselves is sort of that cowboy icon, a very rugged and self-reliant and independent. So I think it speaks a lot to um, our culture here at home. The Mickey Mouse hat is fun. Uh, I think most kids will recognize that. And again, sort of an American classic hat as you know, every kid knows about Disney and wants to go to Disney World or Disneyland. 
And um, even though it's uh, maybe a little bit by my way of thinking sort of old fashioned, I think it still resonates with children. And it says something about our culture, even though now there are Disney worlds in other parts of the world, there's something again, all American <laughs> about that kind of a hat. And one of the things I wanted to do was get people not just to look outward into other cultures, but to be a little bit introspective and to begin to understand how the hats um, represent something about who we are as well. Okay, and I have a few more here. Ah, birthday hats, okay. Um, obviously, that is probably not a typical birthday hat, but that's a, there because it really re represents a, an important ceremony in the life of children in, in our culture. Um, I was really surprised to learn when I lived in Spain, the, the, the children and the family I was living with did not typically celebrate birthdays the way we do in this country. What they did was celebrate saints days. And, and most, um, because it's a cat, Spain is a Catholic country, children would be named after a particular saint. And in lieu of birthdays, that was kind of their annual celebration. So we take birthdays for granted and many countries do celebrate birthdays. Um, but they each have sort of their own way of celebrating it. And in fact, later on in the presentation, I'm going to speak briefly about um, hats that are used in Thailand that also represent a transition from one year to another to another and talk about how people in some of the hill tribes in Thailand might, rep might sort of indicate a birthday. The mortarboard at the top is a graduation hat. Again, another hat that I'll come back to, but it, it's, um, you know, again, it represents an important day in a young person's life and that transition from childhood to adulthood, something that everybody in every society goes through. Uh, the fireman's hat, again, something we would all recognize. Um, it's really a hat worn by protection. And the Santa's hat, you know, I think everybody thinks of, you know, a jolly man with a big laugh bringing, you know, bringing bagfuls of presents to children. Um, you know, sort of a myth, but um, there is a hat that I equated to in terms of how its usage is understood. And in Mali, a country in Africa, every year um, in, in the rural areas, there will be a ceremony that's performed in which they wear a hat called a chihuahua. And it's a hat with a wooden carving of an antelope. And in their culture, the antelope is a very important figure brings a lot of you know sort of good and important benefits to um to this tribe or this group of people and they they honor this antelope who they believe taught their ancestors how to cultivate the soil and and how to you know, basically how to grow things and the ceremony is an annual ceremony in which they you know, they perform a dance, um, hoping for the blessings of this antelope so that they, it will bring them good crops, sort of the way Santa brings presents. They want good crops and a really abundant harvest because that's what they're going to be living on for the rest of the year. So. Very, very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Our next slide has you with several of your hats. We here at the museum have 89 of your hats on collection. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, uh, in the collection here on display at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. So how many hats do you currently own? I'd say roughly about 1,300 hats. Okay. They're all over the house. And when I say 1,300, I'm counting everything that goes on your head. So not all of these are, are interesting or unusual. I have a, like a do-rag. I have lots of different kinds of skull caps. Um, you know, you know, just I have some sort of novelty hats. Most of them, though, are ethnic pieces, you know, and, and in terms of quality, they they really range. Um, you know, there's there's a huge variety. I had no idea when I started collecting that there were so many different hats in the world. <laughs> so with all of those hats to choose from, what was the determining factor or factors in deciding what to include in the exhibit? Well, as I started thinking about it, and in the proposal that I wrote to international arts and artists, when I've done research on the hats and when I talk about them and think about them, I've discovered that the hats really fall into a handful of different categories in terms of why people wear them and why they're important to the different cultures that they come from. So one I talked about briefly was cultural identity or in the case of sort of 
baseball caps, personal identity. So I had came up and proposed five different categories. Um, they include identity. It could be personal identity or cultural identity. Basically, you know, where you live, what kind of a culture or community you're part of and what does that say about you? Uh, another category is power, prestige, and status. And I found a lot of the hats, particularly the hats from Africa, are all about representing um, a person's place in society and, you know, how much money they have or sort of how prominent a person they are. And again, you know, I, I try and bring things back to our way of thinking. And I'll, I'll talk more about how some of the African hats um, represent power and status. But we and we don't use hats so much in our country for that, although a baseball cap could represent status in terms of identifying where a person went to college and um, where they go on vacation, perhaps. But we have so many other opportunities and branding when you get a logo on your shirt. It's sort of the same way of, you know, identifying, um, you know, how much you're willing to spend on something. So power was another category. Um, so many hats fall into the category of ceremonies and celebrations like birthday caps, graduation hats, um, wedding hats, another way of celebrating. So I wanted to include hats that represented all those different stages of life um, from many, many cultures. And let's see, another category was religion and spiritual hats because that still plays a very important role in, in people's lives and particularly um, in many other countries, hats are used to, you know, by a priest or a shaman, um, you know, to, or, or just somebody who's very devout as a way of, of expressing um, his or her faith. And then the last category was protection. And I have hats that are used um, basically for, to protect somebody. It could be some style of a helmet. Again, things that we're familiar with, but there are lots of variations on, on that theme as well. So the next several slides that we have relate to those <clears throat> different categories. So I will let you tell us in a little more depth about okay. those, starting with the cultural identity. Okay, so the first hat on the screen, this one, comes from Peru, uh, although it's a similar hat might be found in Bolivia and Ecuador as well. It's called a Montera, and this style of hat is worn by Quechuan women, who are the indigenous people who live in the Andes Mountains in Peru um, and, and sort of adjacent countries. But it's a hat that's still worn today, which is fairly mm -hmm. unusual because more and more countries are adopting Western styles of dress and you know, I started collecting hats 40 years ago, but I suspect that in many of the places where I first bought them, um, hats are being worn, you know, less, less and less, or are, are not necessarily as, as much an important part of a person's everyday costume. But um, in the Andes, the, the women still wear them. And it's, it's really interesting because the people, the Quechuan people are descendants of the Inca Indians. And I know, I think in middle schools, um, kids study about the Inca Indians and some of the other pre-Columbian civilizations in Mexico, Central and South America. And the Incas were a dominant civilization uh, in the 1500s before, uh, before Pizarro, a Spanish conquistador, sort of discovered or found, you know, went to South, South America and discovered this, this, you know, very wealthy and important civilization. Um, there's a theory that the Montera, this hat, represents um, something very important about the, the Inca culture. And the Inca people back in the 1500s were sun worshipers. And this hat, even today, you can sort of see how it might resemble the sun and be a carryover, sort of a legacy of this very old culture. Because it's round, it's sort of like a, a solar disk, perhaps. And most of the Monteras have rays coming out from the center, different you know, sort of the way they, they've applied the, the fabric on. So I, it, it has a lot of history and quite a lot of symbolism as well. Thank you. The next one. Another hat that tells a lot about um, sort of who that person is and where they fit in is the Glengarry hat from Scotland. And the hat that you see at the bottom with the, the 
black and white and red check is a more typical Glengarry. A Glengarry is basically a military style hat. And the one at the bottom would be used by typically for military bands or parades and or sort of Highlander um, ceremony, you know, celebrations. Um, the one in the exhibit is the, the hat in the middle, which is, is red. And that particular I use the word plaid because that's what Americans call a tartan. But the proper term for the fabric that you see, which is a woolen fabric with a crisscross pattern, in Scotland, it's known as a tartan. <clears throat> um, and the tartans, there, there are many different variations of tartans, different colors, different styles of weaving, but all with a crisscross pattern. And the different patterns are each associated with a particular clan or a family in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, you know, you, you might have a Mc, McDougal plaid or McDonald plaid or a Fraser plaid. Um, each one looks different and again, is very closely associated with a, you know, historically with a particular, with a particular clan. This red one is known as a Royal Stuart tartan. And that is actually the same tartan um, that belongs to Queen Elizabeth. Interesting. Um, yeah. So it's a uh, Royal Stuart. I mean, I think originally before they became Windsors, I think they were Stuarts. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to say, so I often I call it a plaid, but I have to correct myself because the proper term for the, the wool design is a tartan. A plaid or what the Scottish people would pronounce as a plaid is actually the same fabric, but in a long flat piece. So it might be worn as a kilt that gets wrapped around a person's waist or a shawl that gets draped over the shoulder. So that's the actual proper term for plaid or plaid. The next few slides fall into the category of power, prestige, and status. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, were you about to say something? No, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, so, so these hats are these two hats you see are from Africa. They're both from the Congo, and on one side is the um, is a man's hat, and the other one that has a little more intricate design is a woman's hat. They're both worn by people from the Kuba tribe. And the Kuba tribe in Congo is a very, very hierarchical society. And I, as I understand it, there are all sorts of regulations that govern who's allowed to wear what. And, um, I, you know, I don't know if that's still, you know, enforced, but I think traditionally there were, there were lots of rules that sort of said you have to be at a certain social position in order to wear these kinds of clothing or these or decorate your clothing in a style or wear particular hats. The interesting thing about these hats is that they're covered with cowrie shells, which you see at the bottom. And cowrie shells are basically sort of a little, just a little shell that's found either in oceans and so I think sometimes in rivers. It's the, you know, protects an animal, little animal that lives inside. But for many, many years, all across Africa and into parts of Asia, these shells were actually used as exchange or for trade and were essentially a form of currency. So there was a real value for many, many years to these, um, to these shells. And you had to be a basically a wealthy person in order to decorate or cover your hat or an item of clothing, clothing with these shells sort of the equivalent in our culture of, you know, stapling dollar bills all over your t-shirt or, or something. You know, basically it sort of shouts, I've got a lot of money um, and, and, and can afford to, to use this, this thing as, you know, for just for decoration. The other interesting thing is that uh, my husband and I had traveled a number of years ago to Ghana where he was doing a uh, program. And in the museum in the capital, Accra, they had an exhibit about cowrie shells. And I learned that the word for the currency that is used in Ghana, it's called a CD, sort of the way we use dollars. They use something called CD, but CD is the Akan word. The Akan is their tradition. I, th I think it's sort of their traditional social group. Um, it, it, CD is the word for cowrie. So they're, in, in their culture, there's a very, very clear link even today between cowrie shells and and actual currency. So this hat, again from Africa, this also from, um, is from the Congo. This is a hat that's worn by chiefs from the Pende tribe. 
it doesn't it doesn't have cowrie shells on it, but it has beads. It's just covered with small beads. And uh, similar to cowrie shell, beads were often re, um, reserved for people of high status or or prestige. Uh, this is a chief's hat because of the the appendages on either side. Um, they're they're supposed to represent um, the horns of a water buffalo, and a water buffalo in Africa would be or would have been a very very important um, beast of burden. You know, in order to you know, it's the one that would be you know pl help plowing your fields, and the buffalo with its horns is a very strong, powerful animal and very important um, to the economy of many parts of the, the country. So when a chief would put this hat on, he has since took on the symbolism of the, of the uh, water buffalo and, be, and became, you know, just by putting this thing on his head, also, you know, symbolized his own power and, um, you know, and strength. So it's just, you know, sort of, Transferring, transferring the image of the water buffalo to the chief himself. Ah, another fun hat. So this is also, it may look like a wig to people, but this is another beaded hat. And I um, also forgot to mention that across Africa, many of the beaded hats um, or beads were once used, not just in Congo, but also in Nigeria. Um, and actually, did I, did I, I think I said this was from Congo. This is actually from Nigeria. Um, beads have always been, um, again, a way of indicating a person's um, power and prestige and status. And it would often be used by a man, an upper class man, as a way of sort of, you know, announcing his, his position in society. The interesting thing about this hat is it is made to resemble a barrister's wig. And in, in Britain, the barristers, you have a picture of them, still for certain occasions, the barristers are basically what we call lawyers, um, will wear these white powdered wigs. And um, the interesting connection here is that until 1960, Nigeria was um, part of the British colony. And, um, you know, that's, it's just sort of, they, they, in Nigeria, they didn't wear the wigs, um, but I think it's just a, a way of connecting and, you know, you know, sort of acknowledging um, the British, sorry, my cat's about to knock over something, um, um, you know, acknowledging um, the role that Britain played and, and assuming that it was, you know, an important connection there. So it's a way of just, Sort of saying yes, I'm I'm pretty elite and I have high connections. And then one of my favorite categories: ceremonies and celebrations. Aha! So this is an a hat called an isi cholo. One of the, it's it's been really helpful when I find out what the name of the hat is in that culture. It makes it much easier to find information about it. So I'm always sort of happy to to um, announce where the name of a hat. This is a hat that comes from South Africa and is worn traditionally by married women. So culturally, it would be you know when a woman would wear this hat would be the, the equivalent perhaps of putting a wedding ring on her finger. So it indicates to the people in her community that she's married and that gives just being married gives her sort of confers on her some elevated social status. But the Isi Cholo has lots of different shapes depending on the particular community that a woman comes from. Um, you know, they may be covered with beads, they may be different sizes and so forth. But the hat itself is really interesting because it is, it has evolved from what was, you know, probably, oh, I would imagine 100, 150 years ago um, from a hairdo in which women would add fats and twigs and grasses and so forth as ways of extending their hair and making it longer. And then they would shape their hair into a you know, a, a hat that was sort of a hairdo that was resembled the shape of this. So it would sort of come out and be flat on top. And that was a very popular hairstyle for many years. But you can imagine sleeping with this kind of thing would be more than uncomfortable. <laughs> so, um, so at some point, uh, it became detached from, you know, they detached this hairstyle 
from the head and it became sort of a standalone head. But in the research I've done, it's also been interesting because you know how you know, women will wear, somebody will start a style and then everybody wants to make it a little bigger and better and perhaps more ostentatious. So for a number of years, these Issy Cholos really became large. And I have, you know, I've seen ones that, I think the one in display is what, of 16 or so inches. It's, you know, it's pretty big to be wearing on your head. Yes. And, um, you know, for some of them are actually quite a bit bigger. And it was like, the bigger, the better. And then I think women decided, oh, this is crazy. You know, it really, especially if it was part of your head, it become very, became very unwieldy. Now women wear these, um, they're, you know, again, they're losing their importance in the society. Um, that women now wear them mostly for, for weddings or when they're going out for a special occasion or something like that. And the hats that they wear today are really simple. Uh, for a while, they were actually made out of the really old ones are made out of hair, human hair that's covered with this, this red ochre. The hat that's in the exhibit is really just a cotton string that's, that's wound around a straw frame. Um, today, they just use um, sort of a little wire frame with polyester threads around it. So it's much smaller, simpler, lightweight, much more basic. And just like every, you know, in South Africa, I guess, like everybody else, everywhere else, people want to simplify their lives. And another wedding hat. Uh, so this is a, a bride's hat from Vietnam. Uh, very sim um, typical turban to what a you know it's what a bride would typically wear to her to her wedding. Um, one of the interesting things about this hat is that it's red, and while we don't normally wear a red hat, um, in all throughout Asia, the color of red is very auspicious. So it would be worn for brides as a way of sort of hoping for you know good spirits, wealth, the long life, and all those positive positive things as she goes into a marriage. Um, you'll often see it on children as well and, and newborn babies as a way of sort of, you know, hoping to bring good fortune. Um, it's an interesting contrast to, to in the West where um, in our culture, a bride would wear white on her wedding day um, as a way of showing sort of, you know, traditionally showing her purity and so forth. And, you know, in, in many Asian cultures, white is really the symbol of death. So depending on the culture, it's very helpful to know what, what you know, the colors might symbolize. Yes. It's interesting though, because in Vietnam and in so many countries I've traveled in, you see white, white weddings, you know, Western style wedding gowns in many of the stores. So it's a tradition that I hope they don't lose their traditions and, and just adopt ours because I think it, you know, the simplicity of this is also beautiful. Yeah. But, but things are changing everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> True. And then last but not least. So along with the um, ceremonies and celebration theme is the mortarboard or, or graduation hat. And one style of hat that is, or, you know, in every culture, there are rites of passage. So there are birthdays that indicate a person's getting older. There's graduation as a person moves from childhood to adulthood, marriage, and so forth. All of those mark important stages in a person's life. So the little straw hat that you see on one side is um, from the Congo and it's called a laquette. And it is, it's a really small little hat. Um, people would look at it and think it's for a for an infant, but it's actually worn by young men um, who have, you know, probably in their teenage years. And it's given as a reward to young men who have basically graduated and become an adult. And as I understand it, in the Cuba society, there'll be a peer group of young boys who are taken out um, or at least used to be taken out into the wilderness and taught all the things that it was deemed important for a, you know, a, a man to know, like, you know, how to fish and hunt and how to be respectful. And, it, you know, basically they were taught all the things that were deemed essential for being a contributing member um, to one's tribe or society. And if they passed all these tests, in a ceremony, the king would present them with this hat called a laquette. And at that point, they were able to take on adult responsibilities. They could, and, you know, a young man could get married and so forth. So that's in their sense, a, a graduation hat. 
um, represents the same kind, same passage from childhood to adulthood as a mortarboard does in our country, where you know either graduation from high school or graduation from college uh, really represents you know a successful achievement and the ability to take on adult or the expectation that at that point a, a young person would begin taking on adult responsibilities. So very similar types of um, different ways of celebrating, but similar ceremony, you know, traditions. Yes. The next category is spiritual beliefs and religious significance. Okay. So a lot of hats are worn for religious um, purposes. And we started off talking a little bit about skull caps and, and Jewish yarmulkes are worn in many of the many, for many similar reasons. This hat called the Thunderbolt crown, it comes from uh, from Tibet, uh, which is in the Himalayan mountains, part of part of China, and the hat itself—it's it's a metal helmet, but it has lots of symbolism on it. So the piece that you see on top, and actually this piece that you see in the middle—I don't know how to describe it exactly. It's um, known as a dorje or a vajra. They're two different words to describe it, and that is it really symbolizes a thunderbolt. And in the Buddha, so this would be worn by Buddhist monks, um, because and it, you know, again, it has a lot of lot of Buddhist symbols, and the Buddhist symbols all have lots and lots of important meaning. Meaning, but the thunderbolt represents or symbolizes um, enlightenment. And one of the fundamental aspects or beliefs within the the Buddhist society is that you know, every person is capable of achieving this sort of thunderbolt or this, you know, zap of, of being enlightened and, and being a better human being and sort of understanding, understanding the world. And the thunderbolt is really just one way of expressing, expressing that. Um, so, so, I'm, I'm just looking at my notes here. So the thunderbolt of enlightenment also suggests a change in human consciousness in which you, you know, that person, and I think this is what a monk wants to attain, is a perfect state of sort of enlightenment, compassion, and wisdom. So it, it you know, has, has all those aspirations embedded in it. All right. <clears throat> and this one. <laughs> So this is always a fun hat. This, this hat comes from Bhutan, which a lot of people haven't heard from because it's a tiny country in the Himalayan mountains. It is a country that is bordered on the north by China and to the south by India. So it's really sort of a speck of a country, um, very mountainous, very hard to get around. Uh, but it's a, it's a fascinating place because, and I think it's because of its precarious position between two superpowers that um, the, the king who really is in, runs the country um, encourages people to wear their traditional clothing as a way of really maintaining their, um, you know, their, their culture. So Buddhism is a very, very important aspect of of Bhutanese culture. And this is a hat that would be worn by monks as part of a purification ceremony. And periodically um, uh, the monks, and this is a public ceremony to which the, you know, the pe people in the community are invited. And the monks dress up in these absolutely gorgeous, elaborate costumes. They don these hats and they swirl around as a way of really cleansing the ceremony or, or cleansing either the monastery or the temple. Um, and anyway, so you can see a, a little bit of a picture of um, what that would look like in a, in a ceremony. But one of the interesting features of it is the, um, the skull face that you see on the long finial on the top of it. <clears throat> and the skull face is a re, or the skull itself is a way of reminding people of the impermanence of life. So again, sort of figure, you know, factors into um, Buddhist thought and Buddhist symbolism is just reminding people that you're not always going to be alive and to live your way in a particular way that, that at the end of your life, you'll be proud of. All right. And then we move to protection. 
Ah, uh, one of my funniest hats. This is a, uh, <laughs> this comes from a country called Turkmenistan, which is in Central Asia. Uh, and much of Central Asia is along the, they refer to the steppes. It's, it's pretty much a dry, cold, windblown area of, of the earth. It has a, a very rugged climate. It can be very hot in the in the summer and very, very cold and windy in the winter. And this is a hat that is basically just um, made up from sheep fur, uh, from a particular kind of sheep called an astrakhan sheep. It's very, very curly, very soft hair. And you see people even today all throughout, um, you know, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, wearing hats like this. It's wonderful protection. I certainly would want to wear it if it was really cold and the wind were blowing um, around. And then the people traditionally have been nomads. So it's worn by a group of people who have, you know, in, in the past, you know, roamed, you know, they go up to fields in the winter, come down in the summer, and, you know, they move around a lot. So that they really do need to learn how to dress warmly and protect themselves. And this next one has a interesting story, I feel. Yeah. Oh, one of my favorite hats is this little child's cap from China. And the, th the charming thing about this hat is its face which I call charming, but it's actually meant to scare evil spirits away. So it is a different form of protection from something like the, um, the telpec, which we just saw um, prior to this hat, or from a helmet that might be used you know, um, for other purposes. But people can wear hats as a way of protecting themselves from evil spirits. And one of the other interesting thing about this hat is that it gives you some insight into what China was like 100 or 150 years ago. And there's been enormous progress in China. Uh, the country has changed tremendously. Um, but, you know, in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, China was a much, much poorer country. Many people lived in rural communities. Um, there was a lack of education. There was a lack of sanitation in many communities um, and not very good access to medical care. So it was not uncommon for a young child to get sick and not have access to medical care. Um, and the parents, you know, there was a high rate of child mortality. Um, it was considered very successful if a child reached the age of five years old and sort of, you know, was able to, to avoid any other calamities. But often um, Chinese mothers would dress their babies in these hats that were intended to scare off spirits. So the face, you see a lot of sharp teeth on it, would be, would be intended to keep evil spirits uh, away from the hat. Um, and then you see in the, or from the child, and you see in the front part of the hat, a little purple sort of crisscross symbol, and that is the Chinese symbol for king. So uh, when the mothers were making these hats, they might put, you know, shiny objects, which would also scare away spirits. They would put um, symbols on it that were used to evoke different sort of hopes and dreams for their child. So it's another hat that has um, sort of like the, the Tibetan hats, um, a lot of symbolism embedded in the hat. So Stacy, with so many hats mm -hmm. to choose from, I, I yeah. know that there, there have to be some that you would consider favorites. So the next few slides, I have a feeling you've got some interesting stories uh, pertaining to those. So. Well, we talk, I, I do have, it's, you know, it's probably like picking your favorite child. You can't really <laughs> pick one, you know, they're, they're all your favorites in some ways. Um, the, the beaded hats and the feathered hats, <clears throat> two of which you see on the screen right now, are among my favorites. I, I'm always amazed. I'm not an artistic person by nature. And so I'm always amazed at the kind of workmanship and handicraft that goes into beading a hat and making these intricate designs. And the feather hats uh, typically come from tropical places, in particular the Amazon region in, in Brazil or Colombia or you know, sort of that area. It just gives you, you know, it just makes me think nature is the most amazing thing when you see these brightly colored feathers um, from birds that you see, you know, flitting around in the jungles. And I, to me, it's just extraordinary what they do with them. 
Um, the hat with the horns too. I think one of the things that, that sort of gets me excited about the hats is all the different materials that are used to create these things. Things we, you know, I think, you know, in many ways in America, we're pretty boring with, you know, when it comes to creating hats, we would never think of putting shells and beads and fe well, feathers, I guess, but probably not horns and, and other things. So, um, so the hat with the, all the horns on it comes from uh, an area in, in what well, well, was Burma is now Myanmar, very, but I think very close to the Indian border and is um, worn by a chief. But there's something very forbidding about that hat. I mean, it looks, you wouldn't want to mess with somebody wearing that. <laughs> yes. So I know that uh, you said this hat was, uh, had some special meaning to you. Well, this was one of the, the hats. Um, this was a hat that I bought at the Carnegie Mellon Museum in Pittsburgh at their museum store and it was being deaccessioned. It was on sale there and it was being deaccessioned by the museum where I imagine it had been on display or in one of their storage rooms. And I talked them down to, to almost nothing for this hat and was thrilled with it, but I didn't know, you know, I found it fascinating. I didn't have any ha African hats, I think at that point. And when I was living in Kansas City at the time, was curious to know more about it and really didn't know where to begin. So in Kansas City has a wonderful museum called the Nelson Atkins Museum. And I picked up the phone, called somebody there and spoke to the curator of African art, which they have a very good collection of. And he invited me to bring the hat um, one afternoon to his office. And he looked at it and he was sort of fat. He's like, oh, the, the letters, because you can see the letter, the writing on it, doesn't mean anything, but it also, but it indicated that the person who made this hat with the beads, who was probably working for, you know, he's probably just too interested in the craft, but um, this was a hat that would have been worn by a chief or a prominent person. Um, the person at least was familiar with the alphabet and he thought that that was noteworthy. So I love the time that I spent with, um, the man's name is David, Brinkley. And he is now, or at least was last I looked, a curator at the Smithsonian Museums in Washington of African art. But he also introduced me. So he told me a lot about the hat, sort of got me excited and realized that I could really dig deeper and introduced me to the first book I have on hats called The Power of Headdress, <clears throat> which for anybody who collects ethnic hats is really considered the Bible. It was, uh, you know, the first one that came out, I think I have about Oh, 300, 350 books on tribes and beadwork and feathers and you know anything related to hats. But this was the first book that I found and owned that that really gave me some insight into how they're used. Ah, so this is this is one of the most simple hats, uh, and I had to include it in the exhibition just because. I sort of made a promise to people. So the reason that this hat is meaningful, um, I'll try and explain briefly. This is a hat that comes from the Philippines and it is made from a gourd. So it's very, very simple, basic materials. And in the lower picture, you can see these white gourds that have just been probably plucked from a field. And one, I have another hat from the Philippines that's made with a gourd. And I was doing some research one night, trying to understand, trying to identify it with a particular tribe or understand it, whether or not it had any particular significance other than presumably protecting somebody's head from rain. Uh, and I found an article uh, online, this was um, on the internet, written about a man named Teofila Garcia, a man who lived in a fairly remote part of the Philippines who had been named by UNESCO as a cultural treasure for their country. And a cultural living treasure is or was a designation that the United Nations and UNESCO would make for people who are keeping alive in a very important um, tradition in di different countries. And so I guess there are a number, actually the Turkish hat that I have that's worn by um, the whirling dervishes was also made by a, man, a Turkish man who is considered a national living treasure in their country. Um, but anyway, this article about this man had an, um, a byline. And so of course I'm reading about this going, 
I need to have this hat in my collection um, made by a, a national living treasure. How, how can I you know, not have this? But I had no idea where to get this. The, the article I read, however, had a byline from um, the writer with um, which I must have included his email address. So late at night, which is when I'm usually on the computer doing research, I sent this man an email introducing myself and asking if he had any idea where I could, how I could obtain this hat. And he writes back almost immediately, 12 hour difference. So if it's as midnight, it's middle of the day in the Philippines. And he writes and says, go to Facebook and friend this man named George. So he gave me the information and I went and found this guy on, um, who's not pictured here on, but anyway, so I sent a friend request on Facebook to this man named George Leland and shut off the computer and went to sleep. I turned on the computer the next morning and I had all these messages from George saying, we've already selected the gourd and Teofila is already working on your hat. And they were so excited. And, you know, to, you know, I had told them that I was who I was and had a collection of hats and that they would be traveling um, to museums around the country. And I wanted it, the hat as sort of to encourage them and let them know that I was serious, that this was a hat that was going to be part of an exhibition. So this wonderful man, George, who I'm still Facebook friends with, um, kept me updated on the progress of this hat from, you know, picking the gourd and selecting it and Teofilo works, puts this very, very intricate with a different kind of material, very, um, you know, he puts a border on it and he lines the inside of it. So the hat actually allows your your um, head to breathe. It's, it's this sort of intricately woven, you can see in the inside, um, something that secures the hat to your head and makes it easier um, to wear. But anyway, George kept giving me updates and that's a picture of Teofilo signing the hat with my name. And, you know, I had to figure out how to pay him and George had to figure out how I was going to get the hat. And when the hat's finally finished and it didn't take all that long, maybe a month or so, um, George is nice enough to, you know, go to, you know, they don't have UPS, but whoever does the shipping in, in his community and came back. And the, I think the cost of shipping was about four times more than the price of the hat. I'm like, oh, holy smoke. Um, that's a lot. And he asked if, so he said, you know what, let me put out on social media. I'll see if anybody I know or from this community is going to be traveling um, to either New York or Toronto. And I live in Rochester. So Toronto is actually a little bit closer than New York is, but e either place was accessible. And I'm thinking he's never going to find anybody who wants to carry this big clunky hat, you know, on a trip with them on airplanes and going from their small town to another town. And you know, I don't know how many times they had, would have to change planes. But sure enough, George did. And um, he found a woman, a young woman from his community who he must have been Facebook friends with, who was living in Toronto. And she just had a baby and her mother was coming to visit them. And so she recruits, this woman, Jovi, um, recruited her mother to carry this big hat with me, with her to, um, to Toronto. And then I, well, her mother um, was there. I made arrangements to drive up to Toronto and pick up the hat. And these people, I mean, I haven't met any of these people. I can't believe, I mean, so many people bent over backwards um, to ensure that I got this, this beautiful hat. And when I arrived at their house in Toronto, she, did, she had this wonderful spread of, um, you know, typical Philippine food and a couple friends over. And, and we just had such a nice gathering. I mean, I, I honestly, it just gives you such hope for mankind when people are so nice and generous. <laughs> so that's a great story. Yeah. Yeah, it makes it, it's a simple hat, but it makes it very, very special. Yes. And then would you like to tell us about this one? This is a hat that has a lot of meaning, but again, in a very different way. <clears throat> this is a hat that comes from Thailand and is worn by women from the Aka tribe, which is a, um, they're referred to as the hill tribes. And in the very Northern part of Thailand, in an area that's adjacent with Burma, parts of China, Laos, um, there, you know, it's a very mountainous area and they're 
tribal people who are who live in remote areas quite isolated from the rest of their countries and they're known as the hill tribe people and in thailand at least there are at least there are five or six different hill tribes that have been identified and each one of the hill tribes has its own language its own customs its own religious beliefs and its own um you know style of dress the Aka people have the most elaborate headwear of any of these, of the women in any of these tribes. And you can always tell an Aka woman based on what she's wearing on her head. So this is a married woman's headdress um, from the Aka tribe, but it's from a particular clan of the Aka tribe, which again gives it more meaning because it distinguishes um, this woman's clan from other people you know, in, within their tribe. And they're pro I think I have another slide that you'll put up that shows all the different styles they wear. But again, these hats are meaningful because they identify the woman as being Aka. It identifies which clan or in the sense broad family she comes from. You can tell that she's married because she, she wouldn't be wearing that hat if she weren't. And you can also tell how wealthy she is because the more ornate it is, the more silver there is or beadwork on it, um, and the hat, this particular headdress that was up before has a, a rows of coins on it. Again, another indicator of a, a woman's wealth. So all of those, um, the materials that are used to, to decorate the hat add a lot of meaning to, to the hat. I mean, it, it, you know, a person can tell an awful lot about who you are and where you fit into your community just by looking at your hat. So these other hats on the screen, um, the one on the far side with the little sort of daisy-ish, um, those are made act actually out of cowrie shells. And that would be a child's hat. In the um, Aka traditions, you know, young boys and girls will wear hats very similar to that. Um, the boys, when they're around 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, typically stop wearing a hat, but the girls will continue wearing the hat uh, until they reach puberty. And then they wear a different style of hat, which basically indicates to the community or to the, you know, to the family and community that they're reaching marriageable age. And it's a sign that it's time to start looking for a husband for this young girl. And when she becomes engaged or married is when she would wear the woman's headdress. And you'll see in the, in the middle slide, you'll see five different headdresses, all of those are indicative of different clans within the, they're all Aka headdresses worn by women, but they're all um, identify the women as being from a different clan. The other thing remarkable about these hats that I sometimes forget to include is that they're all worn or used to be when I was there, all worn daily. So they're very elaborate. The one with all the metal pieces that you showed first I think I got when I weighed it, I think it weighed about 15 pounds. So <laughs> these are not things you would sort of wear lightly, but the women, they are important and the women will wear them every day. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, very important part of their identity. And I know that you've had some difficulty acquiring some of the hats. And I think this was one of those. Always a challenge. <laughs> this is a, a hat worn by Shinto priests in Japan. And, you know, I would have thought, you know, Japan's a pretty civilized place. It couldn't be that hard to find a hat. I managed to find hats in these remote tribes among these, you know, I'll buy them off of people's heads. So when I was traveling in Japan with my mother, I thought I should be able to find a store that sells one. Couldn't find one anywhere. And finally prevailed upon our guide, um, probably pestered her enough that she took me to a religious supply basically it was a religious supply store in Kyoto and the proprietor did not speak a word of English nor I a word of Japanese and um, we finally I finally was able to communicate to him that I wanted one of these hats and this hat actually comes in one two three, four different pieces <clears throat> and when I bought the hat each of these pieces came in it's beautifully packaged the way the Japanese typically do um, each just sort of elaborately done. And, um, you know, it, it was, a it was a lot to carry home because each one uh, literally was a wooden box to, to protect the, um, each piece. Wow. But, um, it took a lot of persistence I, and I'm <laughs> thrilled with it because I think it's, it's just sculpturally really interesting. 
interesting hat. Yes. And then what about this one? Another hat that yeah, I would have thought would be easy um, to obtain, but was not. This comes from Norway and it's worn by the Sami people who used to be known when I was growing up as the Laplanders. So they're, they're from the very, very Northern part, sort of Arctic region of Norway. And the different groups also extend into Sweden and Finland. And I had, I actually had years ago worked on a farm in Norway. So I have friends there. But this is a hat, uh, and somebody had brought me or sent me um, a lap bonnet, a, a Sami bonnet, and a man's hat from um, both from this area. And I kept looking at them going, I think these are really touristy pieces. I don't think I can include them in the exhibit um, because it's just something, you know, that a tourist would buy as opposed to something that a local person would wear. And I had tried everything I contacted. I'd looked up on the internet, so many different museums in the, this area. And it's a remote, not very highly populated area. But there's some museums of Sami culture and I'd reach out to them and sort of got nowhere. And then finally, one day, a, oh, I don't know who, how I got the connection, but somebody said, somebody from this the, um, Sami community wrote back and suggested that I try Facebook Marketplace. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know Facebook Marketplace existed in the United States, much less in this remote part, this northern part of Norway. So she gave me the name, which is completely unpronounceable, of what I should enter in Facebook Marketplace. And lo and behold, I came up with the, the place where all these local people from two different towns in um, this part of Norway will buy and trade things. And most of it are, you know, ordinary everyday objects that people were selling, sort of the way Craigslist works. But this was, but every once in a while, somebody will have a hat that they're no longer using or they're making a new one. And, and people will wear these, people in the local community will wear these hats for weddings and special occasions and so forth. Again, not typically worn every day the way they used to be. But I was able to find a um, woman who made the woman's bonnet, and um, which I bought, and this hat, which is a man's hat from, from one of the towns up there. So, oh my gosh, and we we're right at the end. I was like, I had to get ready, all this stuff ready and finalize it. And these, these sort of came at the last minute. So I was thrilled with it. But again, would never have guessed it would have been so hard. <laughs> And we are getting close to the end, so I'm going to skip ahead a few slides here and okay. bring up a couple of hats that I think you might want to talk about since you mentioned earlier about the feathers. Oh, the feathers are wonderful. So these are both from, um, again, from Brazil. And one of the interesting things that I didn't mention is that you can tell a lot about uh, how a person's wearing. You can tell, you know, what community they belong to, maybe what religion they are, or what they believe. Um, where they fit into their sort of societies. You can also tell where a person lives uh, based on the materials. So, um, you know, the Amazon is known for having these really spectacular um, birds, parrots and, and macaws and so forth. And some of the indigenous uh, groups there still make, still make these elaborate hats with, with really spectacular feathers. So again, some of my favorite ones. And, and you, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say these well, are hats the, that you would still like to acquire. Yeah, so these are hats that I would love. So I still have um, a wish list of, you know, some hats that would fill in gaps in my collection. These are all from Tibet. And, uh, you know, when I've spoken to people, tribal arts dealers and so forth, who occasionally have things from Tibet, it's almost impossible. Uh, to find these these pieces anymore. They're, they're rarely worn. And most of them are either in museums or in collections of people who have far more money to spend on hats than I do. So they're part of my wish list. Um, um, but again, they're, they're very, you know, they're pretty difficult. Okay. So the one on the left is interesting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you want to just go back quickly. Sorry. I was in Mongolia and Mongolia has, I was really surprised to learn, has a very, very strong um, Buddhist influence. And you see this woman with a horn. So in lots of cultures, horns are very important. And you see this, this woman with these 
black thing sort of jutting out from the side of her head. When I was in a museum in Mongolia, I saw this weird object. It was clearly something you put on your head. And so I bought it. So I have the object. What I didn't know at the time is that it is part of a headdress that has many, many pieces to it, which I don't have. <laughs> so I have the hair piece, but it would be worn with a very um, intricately designed sort of a, a metal skull cap on top. On top of that, she would wear another hat. And then the, this, the horns, which are basically made out of hair that sort of glued together, have these big barrettes along to hold the hair in place. And then at the end, these, again, it's, it's just filled with jewelry, basically. So I have the least expensive piece, <laughs> not, not all the fancy pieces, but it's really an incredible old, um, you know, old, old type of headdress. Yes, and I imagine very heavy. I would imagine it is very heavy. I don't know how women moved with these things on. <laughs> You want me to talk? Well, uh, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so this is another hat, um, which, you know, I, hopefully I'll be able to find one of these. This is um, a hat that comes from Guatemala and is typically worn by one, you know, some of the, one of the indigenous um, people there. It's basically a turban. I can't remember the name of it offhand, but it's basically, you know, fabric that is wound, you know, layer by layer by layer by layer. And I think the women and young girls still wear this, this type of hat. But there's something very pretty and simple about it. I agree. Which I'd like to have for my collection. <laughs> this one? Oh, uh, this is a crazy hat. I saw one of the, something like this once in a store and the proprietor, this was years ago, but the man wouldn't sell it to me. It is a um, Zulu rickshaw driver's hat. <laughs> and it is, it is a piece of sculpture. I, I have no idea how they ride or they, I think they're probably bicycle rickshaws or may, they used to be bicycle rickshaws. Maybe they're motorized now, but they used to wear these very elaborate. It's like a piece of beaded sculpture. Again, I don't know <laughs> if I'll ever find one. I've only seen one in my life and I haven't been to South Africa. So <laughs> And these are two simple hats. So this is um, the one from Japan is one I didn't know about when I was, tra was traveling there. That is a, um, a wedding hat uh, that, that a woman would wear for traditionally for her wedding. And I think it's interesting because in Japan, unlike in many Asian countries uh, where they would wear red for a wedding in Japan, they, a, a woman would wear white. So I think that's unusual. And it's really quite a hood that really sort of like a veil, a bridal veil might cover most of the woman's face. Um, this hat does a pr pretty good job in Japan of also concealing the woman behind it. And the other little hat that's sort of propped on top of a woman's head, it comes from Korea. And again, not a hat I know much about, but I've seen um, sort of costume pieces like this. And I think it's just a curiosity, so. Again, a fun one to add to the collection. And it would also be nice because it's small, wouldn't take up too much room. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then I love your uh, final slide here. Oh, every time I see that, it just cracks me up and makes me laugh. <laughs> oh. Buddha, I want to have I want to have your peace, your wisdom and serenity, and your divine nature and your acorn hat. <laughs> Well, Stacey, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I do think there might be a couple of questions in the chat windows. Okay, good. So let's see here. Uh, the Tibet hat, uh, very reminiscent of Queen Amidala from Star Wars. Ah, oh, I'm gonna have to go and look. That's interesting. And uh, another comment, the orange hat, uh, the wedding hat, looks like the hat Whoopi Goldberg wears on Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> and I think, I think that's, that's great. It. it was just a couple of comments. So Okay, well, I appreciate the comments. I'm going to have to pay more attention to Star Trek. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, Stacy, again, we're, we're at the end of our time. I can't mm -hmm. thank you enough for providing insight into your collection. 
Again, I encourage everyone to come in person to the museum. Make sure you visit our website for, we are on limited availability for people to attend. So yeah. you have to make reservations. It doesn't cost anything to come into the museum, but you have to reserve a spot. And um, you can do that, KalamazooMuseum.org, our website. But please, I urge you to come and check out these hats. They are here until October 24th. So thanks again. Thank you. And I apologize for going over the time, but you can tell I go, always get excited about talking about my hat. So yes, sorry about that. It's, it's <laughs> but nice thank you very much. Yes. It's nice to hear someone with passion talking about something that they love. <laughs> so 